Yeah, um, Tina, yeah, we can't so, see your face, but we can hear you loud and clear and we can see your presentation. Perfect. So thanks, Rachel, for inviting me to talk. And uh, it's a bit of a privilege. Um, I feel like a little bit of an outsider because I'm probably the only one who doesn't live in or near the central Kootenays that's on the call. Um, <clears throat> but I do spend more and more time there. So I've been asked today to talk about soils in the central Kootenay, uh, soils in general, but with a focus on soil analysis and nutrient management in the context of the central Kootenay region. Um, my experience in the Kootenays is, at least from my own experience, limited to the, the Creston Valley and a little bit around the area there, working mainly with dairy producers, but also some hay growers and others in the Creston Valley. Um, so I'm just starting, as you can see on the background, some beautiful views of the Creston Valley and the area, as well as some close-ups of, of the soil that we're dealing with there. So a beautiful view off the golf course in the left and some hay fields on the right down in Lister. And you can kind of see what a range there is within an individual valley on what the land use is. And of course, the land use is all tied to the, the soils that are underneath. So we'll dive right in. Um, I'm not sure if I can, I just have my one screen in front of me, so I won't be able to see a chat, I don't think, but uh, maybe Rachel, you can let me know if a, a question pops up that's relevant to the, the current topic and I can discuss it right away. Um, otherwise, we can get into some questions at the end. Yeah, that so, sounds good, Ken. I'll monitor the chat box sure. for questions. And also, if people are more comfortable just chiming in, um, if they have a burning one, they can just shout it out and we can have questions at the end as well. Yeah, absolutely. And just interrupt me. I might start talking without much for breaks. Once I start, I'm pretty uh, known for that. So um, just uh, yell at me and tell me to stop talking so you can get your question in, please. So a little bit about my background, why it's me talking to you. Um, there's a few things on the screen there, but I grew up on a farm in southern Alberta near Lethbridge. Um, my parents have a, a goat dairy and an off and on sheep dairy, making farmstead cheese, direct marketing, that kind of thing, and then growing all the forage crops for it. So um, that's, that's what I grew up with. And then did a bachelor degree in Lethbridge, the local university, didn't want to get too far from the farm and uh, majored in egg geography, GIS, remote sensing, that kind of thing. Um, really enjoyed that, but I wasn't enjoying the desk work that went with that. I like to be out in the field a little more. Um, I'd also tried a lot of different things like working for a vet, working on an organic cow dairy, working for a pastured hog operation, um, different direct marketers that I was in contact through my, my parents and through the family, family farm there. So on the side, I was always interested in starting little businesses. So was it uh, pastured eggs and, and heirloom poultry and then got into sheep and then got into beef cattle. And then, as you can see in the next line, uh, went off to the Netherlands to Wageningen University to do a master's in organic agriculture with the focus on farming systems, ecology, and, and grassland soil dynamics. So quite a, a broad topic for a master's program, but that's one of the main reasons I went over there is because of what they could offer um, at that university. And then came back to Alberta, worked in agronomy uh, for an independent agronomist in the Lethbridge area, uh, became a certified crop advisor for the Prairie Provinces, but I was kind of missing that livestock element in that full farm system ecology element that I had previously studied. Um, so uh, several, about two and a half years ago now, I guess it is, I, I joined Nutrisource, and, which is a dairy nutrition uh, company based in Alberta, but across Western Canada, um, as well as their Bullseye Feeds, which is the new beef division of the company working as the forage specialist, especially in, in the summer, a lot of agronomy work and agronomy support for the feed clients, but also some seed and silage inoculant and plastic sales and that kind of thing in the off season. 
uh, silage management uh, audits and that kind of thing, and then doing some on-farm research with the company as well, uh, mostly related to harvest timing and alfalfa and um, alternative forages for dairy production, grass-fed production, that kind of thing. And then on the side, I've always been interested in anything egg-related, and my latest kind of hobby side side gig is um, I've gotten into heirloom vegetables and uh, collecting prairie hardy fruit trees and nut trees that will uh, hopefully survive in the Chinook belt here. Um, so that's been my latest thing is collecting those. So a few different things going on, um, but there is one thing that ties that list of everything I've done together, and that's they all relate pretty directly back to the soil and what's going on there. So that has been kind of a, a link that's tied all my different interests together. And as you can see, I don't have a soil science degree, but I've been kind of running circles around the topic for uh, all of my career in life so far. So specifically today, um, we've got to start with geography. Maybe that's my former education bias, but I always, always like a good map. So where are we looking at today? Um, a few weeks ago, Mike Malmberg talked about soils in the East Kootenai, really enjoyed the presentation. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of agricultural land indicated by the, the green color there. Um, in that region today, we're talking central Kootenai. Um, you can see the majority of the agricultural productive land is in Creston on the bottom there, but there is, especially scattered through the mountain valleys and along the lakes, there is a surprising amount of agricultural designated land in the area. Um, and then, of course, down in uh, southwestern central uh, Kootenai boundary there, we, we get a bunch more uh, pockets. Um, one thing I thought I'd throw in is this little picture in the corner of Seth Holzer. I don't know if any of you have heard of him, but um, I'm a fan of some of what he does. He's a farmer in Austria, um, an innovator and an author, quite an interesting character, um, but he's farming up the side of a mountain. And uh, if we all took Seth Holzer's vision, I think half of this, uh, half of this map would be considered agricultural area. So it's, <clears throat> it can be limited by, soil and what we're working with, but you can really build agriculturally productive, beautiful uh, farm ecosystems on, I think, a, a bigger area than is considered even in these uh, agricultural districts. <clears throat> and of course, the soils that we're working with in the Central Kootenai are really built on literally and uh, chemically, physically on what's underneath. So the parent material drives <coughs> soil formation. <coughs> so geological classifications become important when you're talking about soil, understanding uh, the basics of soil. And that's not so simple when you're in a mountainous area. So as you can see in the map on the right, the geological soil classifications uh, really become interesting um, and, as you, and if you would move across into the prairies, you can see that it starts to become uh, a pretty uniform sedimentary base. But when you're in the mountains, things really change up a lot. Uh, if we zoom in on that picture a little bit into the central Kootenai area, you can see Nelson and Creston on the map there. That was Stoke and Golden up top for reference to kind of give an indication where we are. You can see that there's this area is no exception in that nothing is a typical or normal central Kootenai soil um, just because of even as a basis of what's the parent material is underneath. And of course, based on that parent material and also on the geomorphological processes that occur on top of it, um, based on the geography, we can see that you get certain patterns of soil formation. So even though the central Kootenai is such a diverse area with so many different parent materials and, and uh, base layers, we do see this pretty typical pattern in all the agriculturally zoned areas that are a product of valley formation, either former lake bed, um, as is the case with the, the Lister and, and Creston Bench, for example, um, to these lowland valley soils 
and I've got a couple different diagrams there to which kind of illustrate what we all know but don't really often think about as as forming the conditions that we're now working with as a producer um, from shallow slopes with patchy mountain soil to lowland valleys and and a bench stones where we have some weathered bedrock and some lake bed formation which are then further eroded into these valleys and the specific physical characteristics of the soil will depend on that just as much as on the parent material that those features are made out of and then of course more recent history and that really pertains to my work in Creston is that the man-made effects um, as you can see the bottom left there's this black and white picture of the dredging machine that built the dikes in Creston that really turned that valley from a, um, a marshy lowland flooded area to a very productive uh, agricultural land on the Creston Flats uh, about 100 years ago, I guess 80, 85 years ago or so, of the, the final successful diking of the, of the river there. So those are all things that are really important to keep in context when we're thinking about what we're working with. And then <clears throat> diving in, uh, focusing here on Creston because that is my primary area of expertise or experience um, but can be extrapolated to probably any mountain valley <clears throat> that you that you're located in. You see that 50 years ago or so, there was a lot of work that went into trying to find out what we're actually dealing with, and you'll find, for example, this 1971 soil survey map of the Creston area, where it's really divided out into. Uh, <clears throat> Um, pretty complex system of soil polygons really specific to an area based on previous river flows or weathering patterns, etc. And that's a resource that's available online. But of course, nowadays, a lot of things have become a lot more digitized and user friendly and the BC Soil Information Finder tool, I've got a link there um, to help you find it in the future. I won't go there now in the sake of time, but um, really user-friendly and you can just find your location, click on the site and learn information about what soil polygons um, you're situated on and what that has to do with parent material and, and potential so soil type. So the, there's two kind of soil series in soil science terminology that we deal with in, in the Creston example, um, especially with my work with dairy producers and hay producers in the valley there, we've got river flats. And in particular, in this case, you get a lot of kind of technical names that would mean something if you're a soil scientist, but maybe not otherwise. So, for example, down in the flats, we see, especially in those uh, previously flooded areas that are that are diked now, we see a lot of different Siri names. So Buckworth, Tuscanook, Serdurbeni series, those are just different names that given to the polygons, often just the name of the, the landowner at the time. Uh, if you look into the details, that might mean, okay, so that series of soil is a carbonated rego or orthic glay sol or a partially glade orthic regosol. That's what I mean with the kind of technical soil science information. Um, but you can translate that into uh, a more readable English. So what does that mean? That means that it's recently developed, which is pretty clear when you think about the diking that happened just 100 years ago, which is pretty short in terms of soil formation. Um, recently developed soil, poorly drained sediment or floodplain, and on a variable base material, again, that makes sense based on the fact that it's a river valley with uh, a meandering river changing patterns over time and high levels of calcium carbonate uh, coming from that parent material that has been formed that river valley and lacking definite horizons being a mixed soil um, long-term cultivation ever since it really became a soil and then also with that being poorly draining with high pH good base fertility high water table and variable texture those those last lists being something that we can more connect directly to the farming practices we're trying to do there and then the same thing on um, using the bench series as an example, looking at orthic gray luvisol, 
with possible carbonation and salinity. So a Lister series soil would be a lacustrine deposit, meaning lake bed uh, deposit over top of glacial till. So in other words, you'll find a fine textured soil layer and underneath that you'll find uh, the remains of glacial moraines. So a lot of variable texture deep down in the soil, which also means that these soils can drain really rapidly, sometimes too rapidly and cause some droughty conditions, even when there's adequate moisture, if it's not evenly distributed enough across the growing season. Um, and then of course, always parts within those former lake bed eroded soils that are, uh, might have some poor drainage or, or uh, that kind of form a dead end and where moisture doesn't make it down into the river valley and forms a bit of a depression area. So based on all that kind of context that you've thought about when you're looking at your own, your own soil and its context, um, what is a fertile soil to you is something really to ask. And what should that soil look like? Um, it's often said, look at nature um, to see what your soil should, have, should be or could be. Um, in the case of formerly forested soils, like we see in, in much of the central Kootenai agricultural area, sometimes that forest over hundreds or thousands of years has really um, affected the soil itself. So you're looking at the effects of a forested soil and not necessarily, look, necessarily looking at what is the overall potential of that soil. Um, and then of course, what are you starting with? So looking at uh, even the soil in the ditch or the soil in a piece of untouched ground or a piece of forest nearby your fields um, can give you some really good clues, but also um, what do you what do you need that soil to look like for your production, and and what yeah, what should that what should that be? So I've got a bit of a picture here on the right. This is uh, two soil heads or, or clumps from adjacent fields directly beside each other, and a night and day difference um, just based on a management factor. So the one on the left being a long-term tilled agricultural field with just synthetic inputs and the one on the right being a, um, also a cultivated field but one that's used a lot of uh, soil health and biology enhancing uh, management which has really increased the carbon content as you can see in the color but also an improved structure and you can see by the, the root activity um, you can see the mycorrhizal fungal uh, mycelium forming on the roots, that white fuzz that's there, uh, all good indicators that this is a really high functioning soil. So sometimes it's not about what you're starting with, but what's achievable and, and what are the management goals to get there. And then before we get too much into, into soil testing, there's a lot you can do for free uh, yourself, um, just to familiar, familiarize yourself with what am I working with. So, <clears throat> looking at your soil is uh, pretty may seem pretty obvious, but that's something that happens surprisingly little. And just carrying a shovel or a, a trowel around with you can really remind you to <clears throat> dig a hole once in a while or take a spadeful and see what you're looking at. <clears throat> um, that goes together with the bottom ones on our list, like checking roots for for health, looking at your looking at the plant health and possible deficiencies, counting earthworms, um, doing other visible life counts of other uh, visible microbes or, uh, or uh, macro soil life. Um, and then there's things like hand texturing, you can see on the left, uh, doing a ribbon test to try to learn about the physical texture or the jar test, um, putting out a clump of soil in water and watching how it separates or doing some bulk density measurements to learn about how much airspace is in your soil and, and what it's composed of, and you know, even something like a pantry pH test, which would just be, which is just kind of a nickname for using vinegar or baking soda to see if you can get a reaction on a soil solution to learn if your soil is acidic or, or basic at a just a kind of a qualitative level. So those are all things I won't get into more detail, but things you could just do, do your own internet research or get in touch with me if you want some more uh, hints on where to look for how to go about doing some of those things. And continuing on from that, you can spend uh, spend a little bit of money or time on some gadgets and, and techniques and learn even more. 
one that we use uh, often in Alberta for testing the carbonate level in a soil, which can affect its ability to uh, adjust pH. It's just using hydrochloric acid and looking for a fizz response, and that can tell you how much that there is carbonate present and if it's a little bit or lots just on that qualitative level. Um, you can buy soil pH meters at garden centers nowadays that are decently accurate. That'll give you some indication of soil pH, which is a very important uh, measurable element of your soil. Same idea for the electrical conductivity meter to learn about um, salt levels, especially dissolved salts. And you can also get into things more on the soil health aspect, like the slake test, which you see in the bottom right there. Um, watching how the how well your soil is aggregated. Um, if you would Google slake test Ray Archuleta, you'd find some really neat examples. He does a great job of explaining it. Same concept for the infiltration test, just seeing how much water can my soil absorb, how quickly, and that's related, yeah, related to the soil structure, of course. Um, the compaction meter you see on the picture there in the middle is uh, a gadget to just to test how much pressure there is in the soil and you can get an idea of certain plants roots can only break through a certain level of of soil compaction or soil density so um, that machine can can give you an idea if something like a, a soil breaking or hard pan breaking cover crop will give you some benefits and allow better production of your agricultural crops uh, you can do the same kind of test with a, a wire or um, metal rod and just get a qualitative idea of where a hard pan is but the compaction meter will give you a kind of a number to put to it uh, using a bricks meter to test for plant health or a microscope to start counting microbes and, and looking at your soil at a really deep level um, are also possible but of course as you get down this list you, it takes a little more technical expertise and a little more dedication so what about putting numbers to it? Um, and that's where soil sampling comes in. Um, Mike mentioned a lot of these details a few weeks ago as well in his presentation, but uh, they are pretty universal. So if, you, if the goal of your soil sample is to check nutrient levels, then the time of the year is really important. So late fall or early spring when, this, when the soil is dormant and not in an active state of uh, Flux is really important um, to know what will be available for the next spring's crop um, or the next growing season if it's a perennial crop. Uh, soil depth is really important and the zero to six inch sample is the, is the kind of the standard typical one, but more and more we see six to 24 inch or six to 12 and 12 to 24 getting a three level depth. Um, giving a much more complete picture, especially for things like nitrogen and sulfur that can move down in the soil and plants will take a lot of their N and S requirements up from deeper soil levels. And then of course, depending where you are, especially in a more agricultural intensive area, often a zero to 24 inch is or may be soon required for manured fields to monitor leaching. Um, and that's something you see, especially on the West Coast and uh, on the prairies in certain areas that it's actually becoming a requirement to sample, especially nitrogen levels um, at deeper depths. So using a probe or an auger sample, especially a probe as you see in the picture there, are very important. Uh, you want to have the same amount of soil for the entire profile. So uh, if you think about it, if you would use a shovel full, you will get an, uh, a sample of what's there um, in parts per million, but in order to translate that into kilograms per hectare or pounds per acre of a certain nutrient, you really need to have the same amount of sample for every inch of depth. And that's what a uh, probe sample does very well. Uh, if you're doing, depending on what your goals are for the soil sampling, you can kind of think about that as we continue with the presentation, but um, you need a composite field sample to represent most accurately the entire field. In that case, you'll want to get 20 or 25 or maybe even 30 subsamples um, from across the field, often in a, in a kind of a W field walk pattern, you'll collect these samples and exclude atypical, so um, really wet 
depressions or, or really eroded hilltops that are anomalies in your field or getting really close to uh, tree lines or ditches that might have some kind of effect, but trying to keep it representative is a bit of an art and a science. Or you can go the other way and, and decide to do a benchmark location sample, which would be ideally a, a GPS marked location or um, a landmark marked one, something you can measure off. So you can go back to the same location year after year and choosing a representative location and then doing maybe not quite the same number of some subsamples from that benchmark location um, because you're just using that as a reference point for the rest of the field. Uh, and that's really beneficial if you're doing kind of ongoing analysis of changes over time is, is using a benchmark rather than a composite. Finally, getting that sample off to the lab. So choosing a lab based on the relevance for your area and what the required analysis is. And that's kind of what we'll get into now is what, what do you want to learn about that soil? And what are you going to be using it for? And that'll kind of determine what sample and what analysis uh, you'll need to take and send away and ask for. So getting into that a little bit, what are the goals of the soil sample would be a question to ask yourself. Um, are you taking the soil sample just for nutrient management? Are you taking it to a little more in depth with trying to balance your soil fertility? a little more of a long-term view, or are you doing it to improve your soil health or Im improve your soil fertility, that kind of thing. Um, and different analyses are required for different goals. And that's the beauty of soil sampling is it gives us a measurable because you can't manage what you don't measure. So what are we measuring? Well, that depends on what part of that soil science you're looking at and Soil relates to all fields of science, of course. So like we already discussed, your, the geography you're located in uh, has determining factors as well as the geology. And those kind of drive the physics, which in turn drive the chemistry, uh, which in turn drive the biology, and then the ecology. And of course, if you are farming or doing any kind of agricultural activity, then we have to talk about agroecology because it's a, a modified agricultural ecosystem environment. And then finally, that leads to this agriculture that we're performing on the land. And you can see in the diagram there, this one is a little more soil health related, but it's always a combination of sciences, in this case, physical, chemi chemical and biological, soil health or, or measurables that we can measure that relate to different scientific fields and different analysis. Uh, soil chemistry would be the main one you're looking at on your soil analysis. This has kind of been the focus for the last hundred years or so. Um, it's provided a measurable look at what's in the soil, which we didn't have until about that time in that time scale. Um, why do we care about which chemicals elements are present in our soil? Well, every plant needs a specific quantity of specific nutrients and most of those come from the soil, um, sometimes indirectly, but all except water and carbon dioxide and sometimes nitrogen will come from your soil. Um, and if that nutrient's not present or available, uh, plant growth and health will be limited. So that diagram here of uh, von Liebig's barrel, uh, well known in the agronomy circles, is whichever nutrient is least available or least present is the one that's going to limit yield and it doesn't have to be a very a major nutrient sometimes um, half a pound of a certain micronutrient lacking can have a bigger impact than uh, 20 pounds per acre of, a, of, of your typical NPK you might make it all context specific so what about plant nutrient requirements um, NPK get talked about a lot, so nitrogen, phosphate, and potash, and sulfur is becoming more talked about, but what about all the rest? Um, going back to some of those things you can measure yourself on the farm, uh, those often have a lot to do with how much carbon dioxide or water is, is getting to your plant roots and your, and your plant shoots, and those could actually be an, and are often a limiting nutrient on farms. Um, we can understand water as a limiting nutrient in terms of drought stress, but it's 
surprising or sometimes uh, not so intuitive to think about carbon dioxide as being limiting to the crop production. But if everything else is present in adequate numbers, then sometimes that carbon and oxygen can be what's limiting. Um, and on the right side of the page of the slide there, you can see the generalized relative abundance of elements in plants. So this is all how much of each chemical at an elemental level is present in the average plant. Of course, that's generalized a lot because some plants accumulate a lot more of different materials, but just taking kind of a broad picture look. So considering one, one uh, molecule of nickel or molybdenum um, as the baseline, how much uh, of the other elements do we do we need in a plant? And you can see that at the top there, we think of nitrogen as a really important nutrient, but hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen, which are coming from the water and the air, are actually the vast majority of what our plant is made up of. Um, and also something to take note there is you can see calcium and magnesium um, actually used by the plant in equal or greater quantities to something like phosphoric and sulfur, which are considered more typically and measured more often. And micronutrients might be present in lesser quantity in the plant, but they're just as necessary for plant function. Uh, as you can see on the picture there, um, if even if uh, you're missing a very small amount of a certain micronutrient, you can see plant effects, um, sometimes even visible deficiencies on, on the leaf. And finally, are we measuring everything? Even in that list I have on the side there, certain things like silica and selenium are not even on the list and often not really considered from a plant, plant health or plant nutrient perspective. But we do know that plants take up those materials from the soil. So um, is that something that's uh, just not that important or we just haven't got there in soil science yet? Hard to say. So uh, getting to soil analysis results. I've taken a couple examples from the Creston area um, as demonstrations of, of different analyses or goals for soil analyses and, uh, and what that means for what we get out of the analysis. So here's a, an alfalfa field from the Creston Flats from the dairy farm uh, so, uh, analysis from Element Labs. And as you can see, there's a lot of blank spaces on this on this analysis result. So this would be uh, a sample taken just for an, from a nutrient management perspective, um, just looking at those typical nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, sulfur, and, and in this case boron, because we're looking at an alfalfa field, and that's becoming pretty well understood uh, that boron can often be limiting. Uh, it does have in the top right there pH, electrical conductivity, and organic matter. Uh, those are some soil indicators that should be on every soil test and should be looked at first to really get an idea of um, how that affects all the rest of the nutrient availability. So in this case, we've got a pH of 8.5, which is not uncommon in in, uh, in the Crescent Flats or anywhere in the Crescent Valley that I've worked, actually, um, and probably typical for a lot of the valleys, although we know that that geology map we looked at says that things might be otherwise where you are. So that's where context becomes so important. Um, pH eight and a half is a agriculturally limiting pH in general. Um, something like alfalfa might be less affected, but a lot of crops uh, won't be really won't be that happy in a pH that high. Uh, organic matter is two point nine there, which is generally considered a fairly low number, even though it's on the low side of normal on the little indicator chart there. Um, we'd like to work with uh, work on getting these organic matter levels built up. And the electrical conductivity there is uh, a really low value. So um, that's good to see that there's not much uh, exchangeable salts affecting crop production. Um, then jumping across, because this is a nutrient management uh, analysis, we're looking at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, we're seeing that they're all basically deficient levels. So this is a field where not much is being returned to the soil. Um, 
and many years of crop production with a less fertility return than taken off um, will kind of bring you to this position. So this field is going to need some substantial fertilizer applications in order to get full productivity out of the field. And because they've indicated to the lab that they're growing alfalfa here, the lab has provided some fertilizer recommendations based on that, on the above uh, levels found in the soil. So you can see that they're not recommending any nitrogen because the alfalfa should be fixing its own. And that's not always something to take for granted, but you should be digging up alfalfa plants and looking for nodulation on your roots um, to confirm that and also looking at overall plant vigor and color as indicators of whether it's doing its job with the nitrogen. But as you can see, in order to get some excellent, uh, just about six tons per acre yield from that alfalfa, you would have to add substantial amounts of, of phosphorus and, and, and potash and sulfur. And as you can see, the boron level is considered marginal as well. And they're suggesting trying the test strip or adding a pound an acre of boron because just that much boron addition can result in scientifically significant yield increases. So how much, in terms of nutrient management, how much does a crop take out is the way of looking at it from, from this producer's perspective or, or how we're looking at the soil here. And this becomes really a, a nutrient accounting system. So we know that based on specific crops and the average yield that those crops produce in this given area, we can give um, output results for nitrogen removal, phosphate removal, potash removal, and sulfur removal. And of course, those are the ones that are getting focused on here as the macronutrients. Um, and you can see that although it's always regionally specific and yield specific, as you can see, um, there's pretty substantial amounts of different elements being removed. So looking at this alfalfa field in particular, um, we kind of saw those same numbers reflected on that soil analysis. So these things are all kind of backing each other up. And again, jumping back to the, what can I do myself is, is walk the field and look for these nutrient deficiency symptoms in, in your alfalfa field. And if you see any of these indications, um, that's a bad sign. If, if it's a visible deficiency, it's, it's generally also a yield limiting deficiency. And if not yield limiting, it's, um, often a, a crop health uh, issue, which may, in, yeah, in turn lead to a yield, a yield shortage or uh, a shorter stand life in the case of alfalfa, et cetera. So based on that kind of nutrient management soil analysis, um, we can do some nutrient accounting and that's just basic math. So we have our nutrients along the left side there, um, the basic ones being measured here, and I've added calcium just to show how much it will take out. Uh, we've suggested a dry matter yield of five tons per acre from the alfalfa over three cuts. And we know how much of each of these elements is in a ton of alfalfa um, based on previous data that's available in different different uh any, any agronomy supplier or agronomist or a lot of governmental publications will have that data available that's pretty universal of course that is de partly dependent on what's there if, if it's not there for the plant to take up it can only uh um, that number might be reduced but it also means yields going to be reduced and then based on five tons and how many pounds per ton we can do met uh, multiply that to find how many pounds of nutrient are required per acre. That's what we've done on that soil analysis too. And we also know how much is available in the soil from that soil test, and therefore we can find out what our deficit is, and that'll tell us how much we would potentially need to apply. So that that's the math that's gone into, um, as you can see here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, um, but these recommended fertilizer numbers would have come out of uh, some simple math like that. Um, so how would that compare crop to crop? So as an example, what if we're growing grass crop instead of an alfalfa crop? 
and that's where you can see kind of the differences between crops and what why certain crops might be a better fit for for certain uh, growing conditions um, the green chart there being the grass and you can see that they have different nutrient requirements going down the list <clears throat> i won't get into all of them for the sake of time but you'll be able to reference this later um, you can see that something like calcium is used really highly by legumes like alfalfa and only about half the amount is required but is, is present in a, in a grass plant um, so that's something to consider both when choosing crops and also when looking at nutrient management so in this case uh, the farmer's main source of nutrient replacement is dairy manure so we can kind of add to that previous chart of what was our requirement and our deficit and also take some dairy manure nutrient values um, i've just used averages here Ideally, you would get your, your manure or your compost tested. Um, and in case of liquid dairy manure, it's often tested in how many pounds of nutrient are in a thousand gallons of manure, um, considering that those gallons are mostly water. Um, so for example, here we've got 10 pounds of phosphorus in a thousand gallons of dairy manure. Um, then you can do that math and see that it would take 4,800 gallons Per acre of land in order to replace that phosphorus deficit but of course being manure it's also got all the other elements in it so if we would base our manure application on replacing that phosphorus deficit and applying 4800 gallons you can see that um, we're actually not applying enough manure to replace the nitrogen uh, potash sulfur requirements of the of the crop so if we would if we if we would be Manuring based on nitrogen requirement, which you'll often see in a lot of intensive place dairy areas like the Fraser Valley or or Europe, etc. Um, you'll see them applying nitrogen, applying manure based on nitrogen requirement, and that's what's resulting in these excesses of phosphorus and potash building up in the soil over time, and then causing potential uh, um, pollution sources. Um, so same farm adjacent field to the alfalfa field we were just looking at but just to highlight what um, the effects of manure can be so this is a, a sample taken from the corn silage field right beside that alfalfa field we were looking at uh, right after uh, very shortly after the field was um, manured with liquid liquid dairy manure at a, at a high rate <clears throat> and you can see that what happens to those those uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur levels. Um, again, this soil, partly because that manure is included in the soil sample, you can see that there's some extra organic matter. Some of that just might be purely organic uh, material from the manure. So it's not a really a true indicator of, of what's in the soil. Um, you can see that the electrical conductivity is higher than the other um, yield, just be probably because of those salts in the liquid dairy manure and the pH is quite similar. Um, so putting them side by side, just to show what nutrient replacement can do in that context, um, really bring levels up. And one thing to note is that potassium levels don't have an increase that much. Although well, they've increased a bunch, but they're still on the marginal side um, based on these soil test results. And that says something about the, the really low potassium starting level and also the leachability of potassium. So um, some, of that, some of that potassium might be lost. And also, um, if they're not applying potassium fertilizer, those plants are going through their growth process and harvest in a potassium deficient state. Those potassium, low or low potassium forages are being fed to the dairy cows and um, the cow is using as much potassium as she needs out of that forage, which means that no extra potassium is ending up back on the land and you don't really get yourself out of that cycle. Or something like nitrogen and phosphorus, um, which are really high in the grain inputs that the farm's getting, um, will be accumulating in the soil over time, unless you have more land to spread your manure around on. So, 
kind of what's the difference there um, between what we're looking at for, for soils. So you can kind of look at your soil analysis in different ways, and that's how, depending on the goals of the, of the farm. So what we were just doing was what I'd call nutrient accounting, um, which is basically addition and subtraction-based math, uh, as we showed there. Uh, sufficiency agronomy has been the traditional approach to agronomy, which is similar, except that rather than looking at what's my crop taking off and how much do I have to put back, it looks at maintaining certain soil levels um, or certain fertilizer rates and how those provide crop responses, um, because every region will have different responses to different fertilizers. Uh, also kind of an addition subtraction based math. Um, there are agronomists out there and that's kind of where you have two different camps of agronomists um, who agree on some things but disagree on others and uh, that comes with this ratio based agronomy uh, which is really multiplying and dividing kind of math where you're looking not just at what is the certain level in the soil or what do we need to grow a certain yield of a certain crop it's instead it's looking at what is the relative amount of a certain nutrient to another nutrient and how do they affect each other in terms of uptake by the plants and that kind of thing. And then beyond that, soil health agronomy is, is really starting to take off as we get more and more measurable um, indicators on soil health. But at that point, you're, you're kind of beyond science. So we can nicely call that an art um, where the simplified models and equations of science have a hard time explaining what happens sometimes when biology gets in between, uh, especially something as complex as soil biology. Um, just as a, an example there, something like sufficiency agronomy in that bottom middle picture um, showing the potassium content in a plant versus the potassium content in the soil as an example, you can see that um, there's a certain amount of K required for optimum plant growth. Um, so when, but when you apply really high levels of manure, for example, and you have more potassium in the soil than the plants need. Um, the plants may, especially in the case of something like alfalfa, take up double what they need or, or more, and it'll be present in the, in the forage and, and exported off the field. So you think you put enough uh, potassium there for a couple of years and actually the plants took it all up in one year and next year you've got efficiency again. And that's also related to the to diagram on the right there, where um, just because something's in the soil doesn't mean the plant can take it up. It all depends on how it's present in the soil. Is it is it uh, in the soil water or attached to the soil colloid or trapped in in the material that makes up the soil or the organic matter? So uh, the way we're in terms of farm ecology thinking about it is. Uh, how much do we put back? Are we putting anything back? So if we're exporting product year after year and, and not applying back, we're really depending on what's in the soil and that's often referred to as mining um, because we really are taking elements out of the earth and, and not replacing them. Um, not always a problem, but it's just something to be aware of. And or are we maintaining? And that's where a lot of that nutrient accounting comes in. So, okay, we took so much of a certain crop off. Are we? And that means that so many nutrients left the field. Um, so therefore, we have to put the same amount back to maintain the current status. Or are we trying to build up soil uh, soil nutrient levels or soil fertility or soil health to the point where uh, that soil can become more self-sustaining and um, and more efficient with lower input uh, inputs. And that, and what that looks like can be a simple fertilizer or amendment addressing a specific deficiency, or it can be a manure or other uh, organic material addition. So those those nutrients are being applied in in some kind of uh, blend with a carbon source, which often helps protect them. Um, or are we growing cover crop or a green manure in place and using that, not necessarily to add nutrients to the soil unless you're talking about carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, or nitrogen, which will come from the air and be put into the soil by these cover crops. But all these other mineral nutrients, um, they may not, you're not adding them to the soil, but you may be uh, converting them into a more plant available form, which means that you can address fertility concerns that way. <laughs> 
So just to take a, another quick look at this alfalfa sample um, as a basic sample and then jump into um, a more complete sample. So uh, another Creston example, um, this one from A&L Labs, another, another really good Canadian lab. Uh, this one has four soil samples included here and uh, you can kind of take a look across each line as one soil sample. So presented in a little different way from the other lab results that we were looking at. And so what do you do when you get this many numbers back on more of a complete soil chemistry test? Um, again, one of the first things I would look at is what is our organic matter at? Um, in this case, again, the visual of that 2.3 to 3.3 organic matter is probably somewhere in between those two visual examples in the picture below. And the second thing I would take a look at would be soil pH again as a basic indicator because as the graph on the, the bottom right shows there, that soil pH has uh, so many impacts on nutrient availability because every different element is more or less available at different soil pHs. And that's why they often talk about kind of that six and a half to seven soil pH, which would be very slight acidity on this chart um, as being the point at which every nutrient is most available. But knowing that pH number before you start to look at the rest of the uh, soil test will help to explain some of those numbers, especially things like phosphorus and using the right phosphorus extract um, in this case, as a quick example, the high pHs of 7.8 to 8.1, um, checking the phosphorus uh, tests used here, um, Bray as a standard example extraction, but using the bicarb or otherwise known as the Olsen test is a good one for high pH soil. And in your area, um, often the modified Kelowna extract would be even more appropriate. Um, but make sure that your lab is using the right tests because as you can see, based on these two different phosphorus ex extractions, we get very different results on, um, on how much is, is available to the plants. So uh, where do we go with a soil test like this? There's a lot to look at and a lot to cover and I'm already over time. So um, we'll uh, focus on a few key things. So in the red circle, you can see that there's potassium, magnesium, and calcium, which we hadn't looked at calcium or magnesium on the nutrient management type soil sample, but on this more complete one, it's there. And in the red circle, you see total levels. And in the orange, orange circle beside, you can see uh, what's called percent base saturation. And that's uh, demonstrated uh, together with that CEC or cation exchange capacity uh, in the bottom left image there. Um, the CEC represents how many negatively charged binding sites there are on your soil particles, which means, which in turn drives how many positively charged uh, cations like calcium and magnesium and potassium and also sodium and hydrogen um, that can attach. So something like a heavy clay will be 25 to 50 uh, as a cation exchange capacity uh, indicator level and something below 10 will be quite a sandy soil. So in this case, uh, this soil is at a, are all right around that 15 to 16 mark, um, suggesting without seeing the soil and without doing soil texturing that this is a, just from that number, you can already say that this is either a clay loam or a silty clay type soil with with decent cation exchange capacity, but um, enough coarse textured material on there that you'll have better drainage or, or less of a sticky soil than some of the heavy clays. Um, and then how do these total levels in the red circle connect to these percentages in the orange circle is kind of the next question. Um, uh, a more of a sufficiency type agronomist would somewhat discredit the orange uh, encircled numbers there. Um, as not really that relevant as long as each of the numbers in the red circle are high enough to plant. Um, more of those racial based uh, agronomist uh, thinkers would say that the 
relative percentage of each of these in the orange circle is actually at least as important or more, or more important than than the total levels. And often they'll target a specific percentage. So there are kind of numbers that float around and they're generally, uh, we want to see the percent K somewhere between three and 5% uh, magnesium somewhere between 12 and 18% and the calcium 65 to 75%. We want as little as possible sodium and there won't be any hydrogen because the soil is high pH. So in an acidic soil, you'll see that hydrogen is making up a percentage here too. And if your percentage of hydrogen is going up above 10, you're in a really acidic soil. Um, and that can be an indicator of other issues. Um, so in this case, the soil is really high in calcium. That's also, and, um, that's also reflected in the, the higher pH here. And in these really high, very high, as the as the acronym say, levels of calcium in the soil. And that's where also that ratio-based thinking comes into play. Is um, different work you could look into yourself on on Wallace and his law of the maximum. So we looked at that barrel with Liebig's uh, law of the minimum. Um, there's also the other way of thinking is there are certain levels of certain nutrients that can actually hinder things the other way, especially when they're in certain ratios with other with other elements. And that's a, a whole lecture on its own, I guess, along with those next ones. So that base cation saturation on the right side that we were just looking at, it's uh, in, in major part coming out of work from also from 80, 100 years ago from William Albrecht and, uh, and others. Um, and how those different ratios might play a role. And then that leading into work by, uh, for example, Graham Sait uh, in Australia and others who really get into a whole bunch of different ratios. You can see one of them um, on the bottom right here in the K to MG ratio, uh, which is also related to this, of course. And they often want a number between 0.25 and 0.35 for optimum potassium and magnesium uptake by a plant, that kind of thing. So. That can get really complicated uh, when you start to try to combine all of these different thinkings and, and elements together into what's best for the for the crop and the, and the soil. Um, where we're going more recently would be into soil life, uh, biology, soil health, and type analyses. So something like a CO2 burst test, also known as Sovita, or a Haney test, which uses a special extraction that mimics what a plant can take out of the soil or a phospholipid fatty acid test, which you can see the, on the diagrams there um, that give you an idea of the microbial communities or a DNA analysis, which would be a much more expensive, but much more in-depth look at which particular microbial families are, are present. Um, for example, if you have a nematode, if you think you have a nematode problem in a certain crop, you could do a DNA analysis and it would tell you Yes, I'm seeing nematodes on the microscope. Um, the DNA would tell me if these are nematodes that are um, disease causing or, or pest nematodes versus uh, beneficial nematodes. Um, as a, another quick example, uh, one that I've been working with personally um, quite a bit more in Alberta, but um, would be available to anyone in your area as well is I'm working with uh, Neutralytical Labs in Calgary, um, who have a partnership with Midwest Labs in turn in, in Nebraska. Um, even though they're in Nebraska, they do have uh, really good uh, lab programs and do lots of Western Canadian and Western North American soil sampling. So they're very familiar with uh, the differences between soils across geography. Um, so in this example, we're trying to learn a little bit more about well, we just talked about what's available to the plants based on the on, on what's in the soil. So the first part of that test would be using this Haney extraction, this uh, um, modified nutrient extractant, as you can see in the explanation there, it mimics the organic acids produced by roots and tries to get a better picture of what the plant can pull out. Um, and then in com combination with a standard soil chemistry test, you could um, learn something about is my is my soil functioning um, in reality 
like the soil chemistry test says or different things in the biology affecting that. Um, also water soluble extraction um, to see how much uh, volatility there is in the, in the nutrient availability. That Solvita test that I mentioned in the CO2 bursts, just measuring how much carbon dioxide is released from a certain amount of soil in a certain time frame, and that just gives you kind of a, a non-unit indicator of of the just the total biological presence. Um, and then, the lastly, dialing a little bit more on what is in that organic matter number that we looked at. So how much of how much organic carbon, how much organic nitrogen, and then what is that C to N ratio? Because those can kind of tell us something about um, nitrogen credit that might be coming from organic matter and that kind of thing. So that's kind of where uh, we're going as well. But um, this test, for example, would be um, two and a half to three times the price of a, of a um, typical full chemistry test. So a little more involved in, uh, in that. So I'll quickly run through uh, Field nutrient cycling, so how do we keep nutrients in the field? Well, the simplest is only remove the product that you're, or crop that you're going to sell and, and leave the rest behind um, so that you're exporting as little as possible. Enhancing the biological activity and following these soil health principles will really um, not necessarily increase the total level of nutrients in the soil, but it'll increase what shows up on your soil test as available nutrients. Um, as I say there in the bottom. And then at a farm level, thinking about a little bit big picture, building an overall nutrient plan, uh, some of which is already included if you do an environmental farm plan, um, thinking about where nutrient flows. So you might be mining a soil in a certain field one year, but over the long term, is it being replaced with um, either crop livestock integration or, or uh, a compost product every four years or something, just thinking about it longer term and bigger picture. And then finally, back to the, the regional view where we started, um, thinking about, okay, now I know what's going on inside my fields and inside my farm, but how much of what nutrients am I actually exporting off the farm? And and uh, am I replacing these lost nutrients? Um, or do I have to replace these not lost nutrients? Can I afford to extract from my soil without any negative effects because that is possible um, and thinking about cooperatives and partnerships between neighboring farms or consumers or municipalities to try to think about regional nutrient sheds and not letting the nutrients become waste and ending up uh, too far downstream um, where are we headed with all this information well there's lots of soil science is a uh, rapidly expanding field, lots going on, um, lots of different questions being brought up. A couple that I've been working with recently have been things like, okay, what if the nutrients are present in the soil, but they're not plant available and therefore not showing up on our soil test? Uh, and questions like, when do, when do the plants actually need the nutrients? So we talk about total requirement, but is there a certain time during the growing season that's, that's optimal for applying different nutrients? Um, and you can kind of see on the diagrams there um, in a perennial forage, for the example, in the top, top left one, you can see that potassium is really high in the forage in the spring, but then drops off over the summer and, and increases again a little bit into the fall, where calcium, sodium, and magnesium all slowly increase across the season, um, depending on the time of year. So what does that say about fertility applications? And... Um, also, thinking about in the bottom right there, how that, that more ratio-based thinking of if we add more and more uh, potassium fertilizer, how does that affect um, calcium magnesium uptake by the plant? And there's different data that suggests that those decrease. Um, and then kind of following different processes and, and one that I really like, this comes from advancing eco-agriculture and, and a few others where we start with a geological elemental soil assay just to find out the total amount of everything that's in the soil potentially available if, it, if we could make it available. 
and then using things like pH and RH, so the redox or reduction oxidation, um, as you can see in the graph on the on the mid middle bottom there, um, to keep our plants and soils in a in an ideal state of of pH and EH. Um, also looking at plant sap analysis as a new way to diagnose deficiencies and balances, um, even getting into tools that we can take in the field and measure that. Um, and then really looking at field level planning um, and promoting biology and soil health as as kind of the drivers of those of those uh, of that nutrient management. So sorry about going well over time. I see I can say I can blame part of that on the late start, but part of that's uh, too much to talk about. That um, uh, I'll leave yeah, you with. Uh, <laughs> Don't worry about going over time, Ken. <laughs> okay, sounds good. I don't know if we lost anybody. Sorry if I'm taken away from your afternoon. Um, I'll leave you here with some pictures of the beautiful Crescent Valley and uh, my contact information there at the bottom um, for my uh, more than just feed email address and then a bunch of logos and brands to um, distract you there with Nutrisource and Bullseye being the the brands that I work for with more than just feed and then um, the different seed seed and uh, product suppliers that we work with that if you're if you're ever looking for certain products related to that to forages especially um, reach out to me. Fantastic Ken and, and you know the beauty thing about these online meetings is if somebody does have to run it's uh, you know they can they can drop out early and, and catch a recording later. So that is is one of the luxuries we have with this online world we're in right now. So really don't worry about going over. Um, that was a fantastic sure. um, overview of all the different approaches we can take to soil health. I really appreciate your sort of holistic view of all of those. Um, does anyone have any questions for Ken at this time? Hi, yeah, I've got a question, Ken. That was a a good presentation, it's Leanne. Um, I just had a question about alfalfa. If if you can make it lazy by adding too much nitrogen, and if you've done that, is is that crop sort of pooched until the end of its cycle, and you have to start over with a new inoculated crop, or is there any way to get out of out of it being dependent? Yeah, that's a really good question, and definitely one I. I get to deal with uh, quite a bit on the dairies because they often have lots of manure to go around and they want to use manure as their source of the other nutrients, of course, to replace those. But um, in the case of manure, you're getting a lot of nitrogen with those. Um, so I don't have as much experience with uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer application, although I've seen it a few times. Um, it's surprising how much Sometimes the nodules seem to deactivate and then come back, and that's just anecdotal. Um, I don't really have some scientific paper to back that up with, but I've seen it multiple times where um, as the nitrogen, available nitrogen nitrate levels in the soil drop, the, the nodules seem to reactivate. Now, that's not going to be a universal thing, um, but there is that potential. Um, on the dairy fields, it's really surprising to see even when they put a lot of dairy manure down that we still see often smaller nodules that are definitely not working as hard but they're still present so there's still some sort of nitrogen fixation happening um, and then the other part to think about on that is uh, depending on the age of the stand you might have an effect as well because an individual alfalfa plant only lives for so many years and because alfalfa is autotoxic and doesn't allow new alfalfa plants to establish as those alfalfa plants age, they lose some of the ability to effectively fix nitrogen, um, especially in a more intensively managed scenario. So um, the, best, the best way to do it is, is uh, ob observe what's happening in the roots. Um, and uh, if, you can, if you can do some careful digging, look for, look for the nodules and, and cut them open and look for that healthy pink color and that kind of thing. Um, because there isn't really a, a definite yes or no answer on that. Uh, yeah, and also 
Um, one, another thing I didn't mention, but things like um, boron and cobalt, um, not as critical in high levels for the plants themselves sometimes, but cobalt's one that doesn't even ever come up when, in terms of plant nutrition, but it's a nutrient that's really required in that nitrogen fixing process um, by the rhizobium bacteria. So sometimes there can be minor nutrient deficiencies playing a role there too. I don't know if that helps, but it's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. That's good. Anybody else want to step up? I have a question about cover cropping, Ken. I was wondering if you work with many producers in the Creston Valley who use cover cropping as a means to increase their soil organic matter. Um, not so much directly cover cropping and our mutual dairy farming acquaintances in, in Lister uh, are working on some different things with that. Um, but haven't really tried anything uh, drastic with multi-species cover crop blends or anything. I have done more of that in Alberta on the prairies, mm -hmm. um, not so much Creston specific or Kootenai specific. Um, on the other hand, we are kind of taking a step in that direction on some of the larger dairies on the flats where um, looking at just putting in a better crop rotation especially with uh, things like Italian ryegrass and fall rye and winter triticale um, to keep a green growing cover on for the whole shoulder seasons, uh, even when in between uh, annual crops and putting in uh, some of these grasses. Uh, actually, the picture on the, on the right side there is a good example. That's an Italian ryegrass field um, put in early in the spring with together with oats and then cut four times over the growing season and it'll stay green and grow and stay somewhat alive well into the winter. Uh, if the winter's mild, some overwinter even, and come back um, just to fill up that shoulder season. Uh, and that's effectively a cover crop. And in, in the case of uh, a dairy producer with lots of manure, it's a really effective way to capture the nutrients, convert them into organic form, either use them as a forage again or store them in, in that fibrous root. And there's pretty good uh, data from Wisconsin and, and other areas where that kind of rotation can have a marked increase on corn yield the next year, or corn silage yield. Um, so that, I guess, would be considered a cover crop by, by some. Um, but if you're thinking about more specific things like uh, addressing soil compaction with tillage radish or trying to boost soil biology with a uh, cocktail cover, haven't done really much of that in Creston so far, but there we are talking about it with different people. Great, thanks, Ken. And uh, yeah, that kind of question comes from producers out there who don't have livestock and they're looking at ways to, you know, add soil organic matter and build soil fertility over time without having yeah. that influx of manure. So it's something a lot of producers have been experimenting with. So yeah, just keep us abreast as you, you're out there in the fields and you might hear of stories. For sure. Um, one thing to kind of add to that is there is um, some agronomy thought, and I mentioned Advancing Eco Agriculture, which is an American company. Um, some of you may be familiar, uh, John Kemp with his uh, Regenerative Agriculture podcast, excellent podcast, um, really out of the box thinking group, but they have some evidence that says sometimes manure addition is not necessarily even great for all crop production, and that a lot of times um, depending what you're growing and, and what your goals are, but um, you can get a long ways and, and really accomplish some pretty impressive things just from the, from the cover cropping angle. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anybody else have a question for Ken at this time? No? Okay. It looks like everyone is hungry for lunch. Um, yeah, for sure. 
<laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure having you present today, Ken. Thank you so much. I know you, this is your busy field season, so you're you're out there busy. And um, if anybody has any follow up questions that they weren't able to address, they can contact myself or Ken at the email address, and uh, we'd be happy to answer your questions when we have time. I am recording this, so I will send it out to all of our participants. I know we only had about a third show up because it's a beautiful day and it's still calving season and people are able to get into their fields. So I know a lot of Absolutely. people will enjoy the recording. Yep, sounds good. And uh, just so it's on record, um, my contact's there. So if, uh, if you'd like me to stop by and chat or if you have more questions, uh, just reach out. Um, in general, I go to into Creston, coming from Lethbridge, so going through that part of the, the Kootenai um, once a month or so, um, so I can try to arrange a visit into my next trip out if that's uh, of interest. Even if you're not a, a dairy feed or beef feed customer, I can uh, certainly see what I can help with. Yeah, like if we want to discuss like very hearty uh, Fruit tree varieties, for example. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> a man of many I talents. Talk all day about that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much and have a good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great day. Bye bye.